afternoon. Uh, so yeah, so it's a bit of a double header, me and Kasai. So first of all, I'm going to run you through some of the challenges uh, facing omnichannel businesses uh, today, and Kasai is going to cover off uh, some of the solutions. Um, I think I think the first thing is I want to talk about is I, I was I've been in retail since uh, the mid '90s when I started at Kingfisher, and I've done a number of things uh, since then. Um, I was at Argos Finance Director for a while, set Tesco Direct up for Tesco, I was at M&M Direct for a while various other online businesses and recently at P&Q and now at Ashika. And uh, I think what I've learned over that time is the, the increased complexity that comes with the changes that this, this te- technology has driven. So back 20 years ago, it was very simple. You'd walked into a store, you picked something up, you bought it. Um, and, and even the, I used to work in retail strategy back then. And, and, you know, there used to be one or two levers that retailers used to pull, and that was it. That's all they could pull. And, uh, you know, the normal ones are range, price, service, location, theater. You know, you used to probably focus on one or two of those, and you couldn't focus on any more than that because, you know, you can't have a Hamleys in every town. They've got the biggest range, but you wouldn't be able to cost-effectively have that in every town because you wouldn't be able to pay the rents and et cetera, et cetera. Or, you know, Lidl works really well because it's got a really tight range. And, you know, so retailers back then used to focus on one or two of those things. And technology has just completely blown all, all of that uh, apart. And what that technology has meant is that, you know, retailers used to say, right, this is the concept that I would put in front of customers, and this is sort of what you're going to have to put up with. And, and we've sort of shifted in, in the space of, uh, of the last 10 years where, where customers are absolutely deciding on, on infinite paths through their customer journey. So you, you can... Uh, look at something online on the bus. You can then physically go into a store. You can then order that when you get to work. You can have it to, to pick it up from a collect plus point. Um, you can then phone up the retailer and have a courier come and pick it up from you. You know, you know those are very complex customer journeys, much more complex than, than the ones that e- existed in a, in a singular retailer world or a multi-channel world. This, this omni-channel world has, has raised in a massive amount of complexity and, and customers are deciding how they want to deal with you in that. And if that wasn't bad enough, um, the sort of uh, the, the um, balance between retailers and brands has changed. Brands are, are more effectively getting directly to um, to customers. This whole sort of disintermediation is easy to say after lunch, maybe not about six o'clock, um, is, is is happening more prevalently. And the blend between other industries, whether it be tra- travel, leisure. Banking, you know, a load of people out there pitching to me about mobile payments. I'm sure they're all after commissions from retailers for doing that. It, it, it's all becoming a big blend, and it's all about complexity in, in an omnichannel world. And I had a, a, a head headhunter call, call me, like we all do. The, the, they said, well, "Look, working for a, a, a director of e-commerce for a big retailer, and blah blah blah." And they said, "You know, we want to know what, what their accountabilities would be. Can you help us sort of shape that type?" Right? I said, "That that's it. You've you've, lo- you've lost any interest I've got in any conversation with you because you're missing the point. The whole thing around a customer director, omni-channel director. You know, everyone these days is an omni-channel director. If you're a CEO and you're not an omni-channel director," Then, and your business doesn't behave like that, you are not in the game. And the days for people asking for, for directors of e-commerce are losing the point unless it is a very short change management role. Uh, and so that leads me sort of on, on to my next point is, you know, you talk about that in a sort of, again, a, a domestic retail environment, the brands that will be successful in the future, the ones that are massively enhancing internationalization. So a load of sessions on that that today. Franchising, the, the ability to lend your brand out to other people cheaply, especially in, in territories in, in the Far East, is going to become much more prevalent. Um, and then, of course, the complexity of, uh, of marketplaces. It seems everyone's getting in on the act. Obviously, Tesco uh, more recently, I'm sure, uh, Argos are heading that way in, in a very fast uh, pace. Again, this is all adding a, a very high level of, of complexity. Now, the problem with that and, and I've seen this in, in many of the businesses that I've, I've been involved in, is you are massively sidetracked with a load of stuff that isn't about selling to customers as retailers. You, you've got people working on massive infrastructure change projects, whether you be at M&S or, or John Lewis or, or Argos or, or as I was involved in B&Q. The distraction in your business that is supposed to be retailing with all of these big infrastructure, con- uh, con- it's just incredible. And, you know, we've, we're sort of forgetting how to, to retail. And whether it is stuff around data integrity or hosting your own infrastructure or all the other stuff sort of li- li- listed down here, 
the amount of time that these businesses are focusing on at a boardroom level and not worrying about trading is, is, is slightly crazy in, in my view. And the, the, the reason that I'm, I worry about it is, you know, we, we, we're, if we're not careful, of forgetting to be retailers. And I, I feel really passionately that there is very little um, competitive advantage in doing a lot of stuff yourself. I'm a, a massive believer of, I see so many businesses that are out there um, writing their own website code in in-house teams. And, and you sort of go, well, wh why would you ever want to do that? I mean, what, why would you, what makes you think that you can write in .NET a, a better basket than someone who's already written that basket in, in .NET? I just don't get it. What makes you think, you think that you can run boxes better than someone else can run boxes to host your website on? I, I can see why you would want to do things if there's a price advantage of you doing that versus someone else. But you've got to be really convinced that there's distraction that that's going to bring to your business and your board um, is worth it because you should be focusing on on your uh, your customers, what your customers want, how you use technology to sell to that customers. You you, you want to be focusing on the the, the sort of the, the what rather than the the how. Someone else has worked out the how. In most cases, all of the bits I've listed up on this screen, you can go to someone and get a turnkey solution to. You might pay a small premium, but we're retailers. We're not software development houses. It, it just doesn't, I, I just don't, don't get it. And I see many businesses sucked into that and wanting to do a lot of them stuff themselves, thinking it's an advantage. My, my really strong opinion on it is I, I just don't think most of these things are, it, these days, things that retailers need to become, become expert at. Um, and, you know, I, I, I even got a stronger view in a few years' time. You know, you, you will outsource most of your web technology. It will migrate there where basically... You're, you're just putting your logo on, on a set of things that, um, that, that other people have, have created for you in terms of functionality because you, you just won't, won't need... There, there'll be no point of difference of doing that to the market, so why not just go for the pretty much homogenous set of technologies that someone else has produced? Um, but, but the clever bit for me, then, is, is how do you, as, as retailers, take someone else's uh, set of technologies that they've produced and really put the the skills that you, you've got in your business to work and your expertise with the customer. So, you know, the innovation that you should be bringing is not a technology innovation because, again, we're not software developers. It's innovation in your market. So, and, and if you choose the right set of tools out there, any innovation that you think of is probably just going to be a set of rules configuration of something that someone else has produced rather than you going writing a load of stuff from, from scratch. There may be the odd thing that you might get a couple of months' worth of competitive advantage of if you do yourself. But the reality is, very soon other people will catch up and, and any advantage you've had have been, been negated. So, that, so the, real, the real strength in that innovation is, is how you can innovate to your customers because you are the experts in those, those customers. Um, and, and a lot of that innovation will be propositional um, innovation. The, the second thing is, you know, I, I've, I've seen these strategy things that people draw that say there are, there are sort of three different levers you can pull to be a really strong business. Um, you know, one is, one is uh, sort of be the most cost advantage. One is come up with a product that no one else has, like Apple tend to do. And the third is, is customer intimacy. And I think increasingly that um, many retailers will not be playing the lowest cost um, advantage. That's the sort of little model. Um, it's very rare for a customer to come up with the uniqueness of product because we're very much creators of product unless you're a brand like Jules where you are, you know, you have got that sort of a, a advantage and happens a lot in, in the fashion world. I think most retailers will have to get better at customer intimacy and using all of the technology at their advantage to create that, that connection with customers and give them what they want but give them to it in a, in a sort of complex world but be able to do that in, in a way that is laser targeted towards them. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a big believer in, in all of this um, a, a, around a, a new omnichannel world where you're able to do this, whether that omnichannel means marketplaces, whether it means internationalization, wh whether it means um, just the different touch points that people have. But, but it, you know, again, to, to cut back to my, my initial point, in, in this complex world, I, I just can't see how you would do this um, without using technology. And I can't see why uh, people out there would want to use their own. Now, this isn't a sales pitch for Ivis, but it's a great segue. I do, I do have a lot of respect for the, to the guys from Ivis. I work with them um, at Tesco 
Tesco Direct, um, and, and I've come across them in, in, in different guises I've been in, in since then. Um, I do think they, they do offer a lot of uh, what people want, and I, I think they get it, and I think there's lots of people out there that don't quite get it still. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to Kasai. Thank you, Steve. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about the, um, um, the, uh, the three dimensions that Steve talked about, innovation, custom intimacy, omnichannel, and, and how the whole thing leads to, um, um, to, to differentiation. So first, starting with innovation, you know, lots of innovation right now in the market and um, you know, lots of products that assist you in all aspects of trading, you know, from customer insight, understanding what, what your customers want, to customer experience, you know, reward, etc. So, um, you know, and the examples that you know I have here, the first one is um, um, is, is EAN uh, through um, uh, through the transi- tra- transmission, basically. As you see, uh, your uh, you know your TV program, you know, you can um, uh, variance would appear, and then you can um, uh, click on on the product, you know, and make the transaction. To um, next example is um, promotions uh, led by uh, facial recognition. So it will detect whether you're a male or female and then send the promotion accordingly. Um, a virtual wardrobe, you know, we've seen you know, lots of examples, um, you know, uh, about this. Uh, Burberry with their RFID, you pick the dress, you go to the changing room, mirror change the screen, and then to start to play a catwalk with a model wearing that dress. Um, you know, um, following the uh, customers in a department stores and see where they spend more time and push promotions. And then finally, the Tesco Home Plus uh, example in Korea, uh, customers using their mobile phones to, uh, to scan EANs on, um, uh, on a wall in, um, in a subway to order the products. All of, this, all of these examples in terms of innovation, they provide what we would call the trigger. So there is a trigger to an action. Uh, you know, you're triggering uh, something that catches customers' attention. The differentiation between having something as just something novel or, you know, an interesting uh, concept or an idea and something practical is all about the context within which this um, trigger happens. So what we've done is we've defined a framework that basically begins before the trigger with what we call enrichment and goes beyond the trigger with what we call execution. So enrichment is all about providing uh, rich information, customer-centric information, lifestyle information, value-add information. Um, <clears throat> without this information, the trigger wouldn't work as um, effectively, as seamlessly, as um, interestingly, or, or as, uh, as real. Let me give an example. A virtual wardrobe application without having rich product information about the garments and about the products and also about the customers, you know, dimensions, etc., the experience wouldn't look seamless, wouldn't look real. The other example here is the, you know, EAN appearing in your, in your TV. Again, without having the uh, rich information about the products, uh, you know, being worn or used by the, uh, by the actors, again, it, it won't happen. So you need this enrichment to create that value-add um, information in order for the trigger to work. The execution is all about taking the result of the trigger and actually implement it. So if you are basically showing a promotion to a customer and the customer acts on this promotion, the execution is all about making this promotion active, executed across all channels. So these are the two areas in, in our view that um, you know, deserve a lot of focus and we spend you know, n- many years um, uh, you know, working on how to go about enrichment, which we created um, um, an, an innovative solution using business rules to create that value add information, and how to create the execution. And again, we created a d- um, um, dynamic evaluation a solution that takes lots of conditions and executed seamlessly across channels. So that's the, um, if you like, the, the innovation aspect. Moving to the um, customer, um, uh, you know, intimacy, achieving intimacy, what we've done is, you know, we're basically putting the innovation right at the heart of the customer journey. Um, we've been in the business in multi-channel for 20 years. And, you know, if, if we were to basically summarize a framework in terms of customer journey, um, you know, I'm sure lots of um, other examples exist, similar, but essentially it's five steps. Beginning with the customer insight, understanding your customer seg- segmentation, why customers buy, why customers don't buy, um, and, and, and building that kind of information, and then moving on 
to lifestyle, there is a big difference between selling products and selling lifestyle. Selling lifestyle is all about alliances, partnership, is all about having synergy with, with other, um, you know, potentially uh, other suppliers, other portals of, um, of information, and bridging this gap between what you can offer to your customers based on your own, uh, you know, product set, based on your data, and, and what the customers really want. Customer experience, obviously, um, you know, retail today is a, is a continuous dialogue. It's not about the transaction only. That dialogue begins when customers are doing the research. Research about you, the brand, the, uh, the, the products, the services. And then this, this dialogue continues after the transactions when customers are sharing their stories. You know, when they talk about their story, you know, sharing their experience with your product, with your service, with your brand. So retailers who are winners are those who actually understand this comprehensive picture from research to transaction to, uh, to sharing. And those who only focus on the transaction are, are missing you know, the, 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 the big picture, basically. Personalization obviously comes in, in, in all sorts of shapes in terms of uh, providing the information relevant to the segment, providing the offerings relating to what the customers want, and finally, reward. You know, promotions is a very powerful um, weapon, but promotion shouldn't be given you know, to everyone. Uh, it should be provided you know, either when you want to entice someone for a transaction or when you want to reward someone. So these are examples in terms of what a typical life cycle you know, would take. And again, as you can see, uh, you know, the innovation right at the heart of it. Moving to the next level now and talking about omnichannel. So obviously, latest buzzword, everyone's talking about omnichannel. So um, in terms of what it means, um, we as an organization have been implementing omnichannel since 2009 when we implemented a solution for Carphone Warehouse that uh, basically rolls out promotions across 850 stores, physical stores, in addition to the website and additional other touch points. Total of 1,200 touch points. That's omnichannel because when the promotion is published, it's published across all channels. But omnichannel, you know, omni meaning all, is first of all about sharing. Um, as a customer, um, I can use one channel to do my search, I can use a second channel to transact, to buy the product, I can have the product fulfilled from a third channel, and if I'm unhappy, I can return it to a fourth channel and use a fifth channel you know, to share my experience. All these channels must share something. They must share my information, because if I buy from one channel, go to another channel to return it, and they don't know about me, the customer, or about the product, or about the offer, the price, promotions, then you get poor customer experience. This is obviously, technology has a big role to play, but in addition to technology, this is also about process, about people, about getting the organization aligned. Click and collect as a model, uh, you know, ask the questions, who would get the commission for that sale? Is it the web team? Is it the store team? And the answer is both. So it's, it's all about understanding what the organization needs in terms of having it aligned, um, and what's aligning the organization, the whole point of Omnichannel, is the customer, is the customer driving this whole thing. And uh, at the end of the day, customers don't care, care about multi-channel or omni-channel or channels. They all care about you know, receiving good quality service consistently across any means they use. Um, and, and, good, and good customer service. That's ultimately what it's all about. So the sharing is quite important in terms of understanding how you share the information. Uh, and the second aspect, which is the hardest, is to transform the organizations to be customer-centric. Nine out of ten, you know, uh, you ask any retailers, how customer-centric are you? And, you know, and almost everyone will basically say, we are customer-centric. And it's only when you start to drill down and understand how they go about, you know, from marketing to merchandise, customer service, supply chain, etc., then you realize, you know, it's, it's really they, they're paying lip service to it, and it's not really a customer-centric organization. What we've done here is we've taken the customer life cycle and embedded it within what we call the trading cycle. So these are 12 steps that you will need to go through in any trading um, venture, from um, planning your budget to range management, product induction, enrichment, all the way to merchandise, marketing, delivery, and dashboard. So 12 steps mimicking the trading cycle. And the customer life cycle is right at the heart of this, which basically means Customers is all about what the customer wants and what the customer is expecting in terms of how decisions are made and how organizations are transformed. So 
that's um, uh, you know uh, basically what omnichannel um, for us is, is all about. And as I said, we've been um, implementing solutions um, to basically ensure you have the, the uh, consistency in terms of offerings across all channels as early as 2009. Now, these are the three dimensions that um, Steve talked about in, in terms of. How, how do we put it all together now and, and basically uh, wrap it up? So this is a typical, uh, you know, uh, website. Uh, looking at the at the homepage, not um, an example of the best uh, design, but you know the reason is so busy because you know just want to illustrate what's actually happening. So if you look at that page, you can see that uh, you know we have a number of uh, hotspots, you know, for your merchandising in terms of what what products you want to. Um, to highlight, then you have a um, number of um, uh, captions from, from social network in terms of what customers are buying, what customers are doing. Then you have bottom left, um, uh, you have um, um, an idea in terms of taking um, uh, customer's feedback through clickstream analysis and feeding it as enrichment. So for example, if you have 100 customers coming to the website looking for um, garden party, uh, you know, dress code, and they find nothing, but they all buy uh, a, a linen jacket, chances are, you know, the catchy manager need to enrich linen jackets with, um, uh, with, with, with garden um, uh, uh, party as, as a lifestyle, um, which is basically an example of uh, listening to what the customers are doing and then taking action. Uh, or uh, looking at the most, um, you know, uh, popular uh, item on, on the net and so on, you know, you have the social interactions and video. Underneath, you have all the channels. So, you know, when, um, when people talk about channels, it's not only the mobile, the social, the e-commerce, you know. The most important channel is, is being missed, and that's the store. So, physical store, in terms of um, being synchronized to, to, the, to the other channels, is the true meaning of omnichannel, rather than just you talking in terms of digital. So, we have all the channels here. So, in terms of what I've been talking about so far, in terms of the enrichment and execution, I just want to show you how does it actually um, work out. So the, the yellow symbol here, the yellow engine, um, is the, uh, represents the business rules, the product enrichment that I talked about. And the examples we have here is the ability to change range based on seasonality. Um, ability to, um, uh, to go to um, a brand um, a portal, website, capture a piece of information which might not be rich enough and then enrich it automatically and display it on the website. Ability to influence your merchandising based on weather fluctuation, an external factor, or based on internal factor such as stock. Um, and, and, and the list goes on, you know, uh, ability to use your analytics to automatically drive changes in terms of the enrichment example I, I mentioned or taking feed from social network and then showing you what your, what your friends are buying, what your friends are, are looking at and doing and so on. The key word here, this is all happening automatically. You know, you define the rules once and then these rules will be triggered based on either internal or external factors and it will effectively, um, you know, merchandise the site for you automatically. The next step where you see the, 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 the blue icon. The blue icon signifies the execution I mentioned. So this is the evaluation, uh, you know, this is the dynamic evaluation uh, solution I talked about, which basically means you take lots of conditions uh, at uh, massive uh, speed, massive scale, and then you have to work out the answer in split second and then disseminate this information across channels. So promotion is an example of such a complex, uh, you know, uh, formula to, to work out. Lots of factors affecting a promotion. Uh, you know, information about yourself as the customer, information about the product, about the store, about time of the day, and so on and so forth. So, you know, ability to take all of these conditions, work it out, and then produce the promotion is what we are talking about as an example in terms of execution here, as the example I gave in terms of the car from warehouse. But in addition, you know, we use the same uh, solution basically to work out what's the optimum path for the customer uh, in terms of a marketplace, uh, marketplace applications with having multiple merchants, what will be the, um, uh, you know, the, the best route in terms of uh, you know, delivering the products. Um, fraud detection, again, is, is another example. Uh, working out um, you know, um, the relationship between your site and affiliates, again, based on these kind of evaluations. So effectively, what we're talking about here is understanding all retail aspects, all the activities, as I showed you in that trading cycle, and then working out 
which, which part of it you, know, you can influence, you can manage by the concept of enrichment. And once this happens, how do you execute it? How do you disseminate it? So um, this gives you um, an idea, hopefully, in terms of um, how the whole thing fits together. We talked about the three dimensions and then giving you, hopefully, a real example. I know it's um, quite a busy page, but hopefully that gives you an idea in terms of how you achieve differentiation and how you focus on these three areas. Steve, do you want to... Uh... Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I think the only thing I wanted to add at the end, really, is... is you know, you, you can see the level of complexity there. You know, if you've got, let's say you've got a million people visiting your website a week, you know, the, the days of, of Arkwright where you used to walk into a shop and have a one-to-one -one relationship with them and, and that, that person would be optimizing the amount of money you took from that customer over a time period are gone. You know, the, the, the days of a million people visiting you in a, in a week and you having a set of tools to optimize that relationship is the age that we live in now. And I, I generally, you're not going to do that by having a million people sat in a room watching everyone as they come. With, with all of the complexity around all of the inputs and all of the channels, uh, you know, again, I don't think you can do that without, without heavy leverage of technology. Great.